Welcome to our another video podcast of Mitral Valve case presentation. In this podcast, along with my panelists, Drs. Ruma Bose, Aitan Sharkey, and Senkap Segal, we'll be reviewing a case of mitral regurgitation with atrial fibrillation that required a critical anatomical diagnosis in the pre-cardiopulmonary bypass examination for mitral valve repair. We'll be going over the various nuances of 2D and 3D examination and the dilemma that we faced and the steps we took to resolve the dilemma. Thank you very much and enjoy the podcast. So our case presentation today is a 73 year old lady who presented with acute shortness of breath, uh, was worked up in an outside hospital, was found to have severe mitral regurgitation which was primarily exercise induced induced and she also had mild aortic insufficiency and mitral tricuspid regurgitation. Of note, she had chronic atrial fibrillation and history of one TIA that resolved by itself. Uh, and she was scheduled to undergo a maze procedure, left atrial appendage ligation, and also uh, mitral valve repair slash replacement. But she was very motivated to undergo a mitral valve repair and so therefore the exam was pretty crucial. Um, the pre-bypass uh, exam was pretty crucial and we performed a comprehensive clinical examination and looked and interrogated the mitral regurgitation at multiple views using two-dimensional and three-dimensional imaging. Uh, looking at the mitral valve, my initial impression was that there were essentially no structural abnormality of the mitral valve. It looked like uh, both leaflets were moving fine. There was no obvious flail or prolapse or leaflet restriction. And, uh, but there was still moderate to severe mitral regurgitation depending upon mm -hmm. what the filling pressure and the position and the, and the aft load was. And as we go along and do the whole examination, it really wasn't very obvious what the possible reason uh, for this mitral regurgitation was. Uh, looking at all these echoes, Aiden, what do you think is the reason for mitral, valve, mitral regurgitation? Yeah, so... Uh, looking at the images here, um, I mean, we can see, as you said, that there's, you know, there's no leaflet perforation, there's no um, excessive leaflet motion, I'm not seeing any restricted leaflet motion, so that rules out type 2, type 3 uh, dysfunction. Um, looking at the AP diameter, um, I know this lady's uh, BSA, um, she, she was quite a small lady. So you could say that uh, the AP diameter is a bit dilated given in the context of her, of her BSA. Um, and also knowing in her history as well that she had a normal coronary angiogram so we can rule out any ischemic cause for this uh, mitral regurgitation. So incorporating all that together, you know, I would say this is a type one dysfunction um, with uh, dilatation um, uh, of her left atrium. So while this patient has central MR, and as Aidan pointed out, that it appears that left atrial dilation is causing MR. Senka, what do you think? Is that the primary mechanism for this mitral regurgitation? Yeah, it appears that uh, the left atrial dilation is, uh, is what's causing the, uh, the significant mitral regurgitation. So and to follow up on this, do you think mitral regurgitation is the primary thing that led to left atrial dilation and, and a vicious cycle of more MR? or the patient had left atrial dilation for another reason and then had an MR? Uh, so reviewing this closely, seems like the left atrial dilation was the uh, primary cause that caused the mitral regurgitation. Okay, and, and do you think that is, is repairing the valve going to help it just because the left atrium will continue to dilate? Because what could be the cause of left atrial dilation in this patient? Uh, could be, uh, you know, history of atrial fibrillation and uh, obviously mitral regurgitation could um, could worsen dilation as well as dysfunction, 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 and dysfunction and exactly. LVDP. So, so fixing the mitral regurgitation will, will definitely help uh, uh, reduce or remodel the left atrium. Great. Based on the focused mitral valve examination so far, we have concluded that of the three Carpentier mechanisms of mitral regurgitation, this patient has type 1 dysfunction, which means there is no abnormality of leaflet motion, and the reason for mitral regurgitation 
is annular dilation, secondary to her left atrial dilation. And whereas the AP diameter of the annulus is 3.2 centimeters square, however, considering her small body surface area, this appears to be a dilated mitral annulus. Therefore, uh, this patient needs further investigation into the structure and function of the mitral leaflets. So then we go on to acquire a live 3D on fasci of the mitral valve, which besides being of a very low frame rate, also shows an abnormal looking valve with a lot of lumps and bumps, uh, focal thickenings and possible areas of calcification. And so it is not an entirely normal looking valve. Uh, what do you think, Ruma? So looking closely at this, uh, at this uh, 3D clip, uh, it seems there is um, a cleft between P1 and P2. Um, and I'm wondering, yes. And do you think it, it this, is this cleft contributing to mitral regurgitation? So there are two, uh, uh, it could be confounding because the mitral regurgitation jet that we saw in 2D was central in nature. And um, the cleft would attribute to an eccentric jet. Uh, so we need to uh, examine this valve further to figure out uh, if the cleft is actually a uh, real cleft or a uh, echo dropout. So that is a very good point and I think we need to do some additional measures to, to truly resolve this dilemma. Three-dimensional echocardiographic examination in patients with arrhythmias is particularly challenging. Since R-wave gated acquisition and reconstruction cannot be performed because of irregular R to R wave intervals. An irregular R to R wave interval is an absolute requirement and therefore images with the highest spatial and temporal resolutions cannot be acquired in these patients. And even if it is attempted, it leads to temporal dyssynchrony which results in a stitching artifact in creating an image which is uninterpretable. Based, of, based on this limitation, Ruma, do you have something in your bag of tricks to defy the constraints of time and space in these patients? You are absolutely right. Uh, there, these are the challenges that we face in patients with uh, atrial fibrillations and irregular heartbeats. The imaging is uh, suboptimal if we go by the, the normal rules. The R gate uh, gated acquisition is uh, not possible in these uh, patients. So one of the things that we could consider and uh, we do is uh, narrow sector imaging, live, um, live narrow sector imaging, where we um, uh, the sector size is narrow to maximize our line, line density, and we move the probe uh, across the mitral valve to visualize the entire structure piecemeal. So that would essentially mean either you can change the elevational width of the of the frustum that is coming out of the of the TE probe from the intralateral to the posteromedial commissure, and and uh, at the same time, or you could move the probe just like monoplane examination from the intralateral to the posteromedial commissure, so achieving highest frame rate and highest uh, uh, line density in these patient in this patient. So as you can see, in this patient we resorted to the live and narrow sector imaging of the mitral valve. As Ruma pointed out to be a piecemeal examination going from the anterolateral to the posteromedial commissure. Uh, looking at these images, Aiden, what do you think? Are we able to conclusively establish that this was not a cleft or the other way around? What do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a very good technique to improve your image quality in these patients with uh, atrial fibrillation to achieve a, a high temporal resolution. However, it doesn't always uh, give you the answer you want, as in this case, I don't think we can really definitively answer the question with regards to uh, is this a cleft or not. And I think, I mean, the reason for this is in patients with mitral regurgitation, uh, such as this patient, you know, they can have a massively dilated left atrium. As a result of this dilated left atrium, the, the mitral valve is, is very much in the far field. And even with using you know, tricks such as this, you will still get uh, beam divergence. And as a result, you'll get a reduction in your line density. And also very importantly, you'll also get a reduction in your lateral resolution. Um, so even though this is a very good technique, I think in this particular instance, uh, it doesn't answer our question uh, that we want. 
Whereas three-dimensional echocardiography is considered extremely useful and valuable for diagnosing clefts that extend all the way to the base of the leaflet, grooves that are only halfway from the edge to the base of the leaflet, and perforations. However, sometimes uh, it is ex- it's extremely difficult to diagnose a perforation or a cleft from an image dropped out, which is a uh, purely a function of uh, gain of the system, which means if uh, sometimes the image is undergained, uh, particularly in thinner surfaces such as valve leaflets, there can be image dropouts which are uh, difficult or sometimes impossible to differentiate from perforations and clefts. And uh, there are certain means that we'll discuss and measures that we can discuss that can that can make this diagnosis, but it is uh, sometimes not possible to do it. So to conclusively diagnose the presence or absence of a cleft between P1 and P2, we advance the T probe into the stomach and obtain the basal short axis view, often referred to as the fish mouth view of the mitral valve. And as you can see that we can definitively diagnose a cleft between P1 and P2, and with the con- incorporation of the colorful Doppler information, it is quite obvious that this uh, cleft is between P1 and P2 is not contributing significantly to mitral regurgitation, and therefore uh, the reason why this regurgitation jet is central and not eccentric in this patient. We learned some important lessons in this video podcast. Importantly, left atrial dilation can cause MR by mitral annular dilation. It can be difficult to differentiate between clefts and grooves and image dropout. The requirements and limitations of r gated acquisition and the value of narrow sector, high frame rate and high line density examination of the mitral valve will be presented in this podcast. Importantly, we must never forget to, inc- to always utilize and incorporate valuable 2D information in our routine 3D, three-dimensional examination of the mitral valve. Last but not the least, we discussed in detail the impact of far field imaging on beam divergence and the deterioration of lateral resolution, particularly for valvular examination. I hope you liked the case presentation in this video podcast and the panel discussion with our panelists. Uh, please stay tuned for more of our educational podcasts in the future. Thank you very much and stay tuned.